السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بأحسان إلى يوم الدين قال الله تعالى يا بني آدم قد أنزلنا عليكم لباسا يواري سوآتكم وريشا ولباس التقوى ذلك خير وقال تعالى وجعل لكم سرابيل تقيكم الحر وسرابيل تقيكم بأسكم As I mentioned last week this book is Qiyad al-Salihin written by Imam Nawawi rahimahullah or compiled by Imam Nawawi rahimahullah who have collected ahadith from different books of ahadith to give us some understanding of our day-to-day -day life how should we be performing different things in accordance with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and according to the instructions received by Rasulullah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given us so many beautiful instructions that we can appreciate them only once we go through the ahadith. Because most of the time, we are not even aware of the beautiful teachings of Islam. And many times we ourselves fail to understand the beauty of this religion. And if we are to ask, if we were to, uh, if we were asked to explain some unique things of our religion that do not ex exist in other religions, it may be difficult for us to answer those questions because we ourselves haven't studied the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam to know the beauty of the deen and to know the beautiful teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it's extremely important for us as Muslims to know what kind of instructions we have in the hadith. Number one, to follow them. And number two, to know the importance of our deen that we are following. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he was a messenger of Allah who was sent to this universe to be a guide for all the human beings, not only of his time, for human beings that are to come till the day of judgment. If you look at the previous nations, you would see that a prophet came and within two to three hundred years all the teachings of that prophet were changed and there was a need to have another prophet. And the remaining chain, uh, teachings were obsolete. They were not something that could be followed forever. They came according to the need of the time and then right after the prophet departed from the world, there was a need to have a new code of life. But when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
He gave him such instructions that can be in effect till the day of judgment. With all the changes that are taking place in the world, with all the advancement of the technology, with all the invention of new countries, new places, changes of weathers and everything, still all the laws of the Sharia are in effect and they will remain in effect, in effect till the day of judgment. This is the beauty of the deen. Today when we make a law, and when any country makes a law, they don't know if 10 years from this time, if these laws will be practical or not. And people will be able to follow these or not, or there will be a need to amend, to amend them and to bring new laws. But subhanallah, the laws of the Quran and Sunnah are such that regardless of how much changes will take place in the world and how far away we are getting from the time and now we are more than 1400 years away from the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, still those instructions can be followed with the same beauty and in the same manner the way they were taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, the only obstacle we will have in our way in following those instructions is people don't like them. And that was the same situation when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was there that there were people who didn't like them. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had already informed us in هَذَا الدِّينَ بَدَأَ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ غَرِيبًا كَمَا بَدَأَ When this deen started, it was very strange. And people used to consider the followers of this deen as strangers in their communities. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, soon a time will come when this deen will become a stranger again. And people will look at those who are following the deen and they will think, where did you come from? What are you doing? This is, this is a different world now. We are not in those days. You can't do this anymore. You can't pray like this anymore. You can't be making wudu like this. You can't wash your feet like this anymore. These things are not made to wash your feet. So people not liking them, that was there at that time, and that will remain there. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam predicted that it will get as, wor- as bad as it was at the very beginning. And therefore he says, فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَى He says, although people won't like it, but remember, I give good news to those who would follow them in spite of people making fun of them, in spite of people not liking them, because those are the people who will be keeping my way of life alive. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he gave us these laws that can be followed till the day of judgment, at the same time, he gave us instructions about each and everything that we have to face in our life. This deen is complete and comprehensive. Did not leave anything without answering the questions about it and without giving us instructions about that field. This is the beauty of this deen. As the followers of any religion, what does your religion say is about backbiting? It will be difficult to find instructions about that. What does your religion say about codes of dress? It will be difficult to find answers to these questions. What does your religion say about using the bathroom and instructions? It will be difficult to get get answers to these questions. Although these are the things that we face in our day-to-day life and everything, we, every day we have to perform them. Every day people are using the bathroom. Every day people are eating. Every day people are putting some dress on and taking some off. And every day people sleep and every day they wake up. Every day they leave home, they enter home. I mean, these are the things that we face in our day-to-day life. And not having instructions about these will simply means that most of the part of our life is not deen. 
It's only when you go into the mosque and you perform the prayer or you spread your musalla and you perform the prayer for five minutes. That was ibadah, that was deen, and rest of it you have nothing to do with God. But that's unacceptable. For a believer who's trying to please God, it's unacceptable that either he is going to leave his work, he's not going to sleep, he doesn't want to eat, he doesn't want to stand and spend any time in the bathroom because he wants to please God, therefore he's going to be just doing prayers. He's not going to do anything else because that's the only way he's going to be pleasing God because that's the only instructions he has about from the religion. But we can't do that. We have needs. We have necessities in our life. And we have to fulfill them. We have to go to work. We have to eat. We have to drink. We have to sleep. We have to rest. We have to deal with our families. We have to deal with our children. We have to spend time with them. And spending all of that time and doing all of these things, if these things are not part of religion, and these things are just part of day-to-day life, has nothing to do with deen, with our relationship with God, then simply means for all of that time we are broke off from God, we are broke off from religion, and the very limited time that we spend of a day, that's the only time that we are spending for the sake of God. And for those who would like to be virtuous, it's unacceptable. So either they're going to leave everything and just do that, just like there are people in the previous religions who, when they didn't find instructions from deen that will give them detailed instructions about all of these ways of life, they went out in the jungles. Meditating, doing nothing else. They broke off from their families, from their relatives, from the town, from the neighborhood, from everyone else because they thought that's the only way of pleasing God that you be just be by yourself in the jungle and just keep on offering as much worship, worship as you can. And the time that you are off that prayer rug and the time you are not doing that prayer and you are not meditating, you are not doing one of those services, you are eating, you are drinking, you are doing something else, that time is being wasted. But the beauty of this thing is that each and everything became a worship. If we do it according to the instructions received from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, each and everything becomes worship in our deen. So now when the person is eating, he's not wasting time. And he's not disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not that now as long as he's eating, he has nothing to do with the religion and with the pleasure of God. No. Even the time that he's spending eating, the whole time becomes ibadah. The time that he's sleeping, that whole time can become ibadah. The time that he's in the bathroom, even for that he can get get reward. The time that he's spending with his family and enjoying He's not doing for any other purpose. He likes to enjoy. But if he does it according to the instructions received from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even that time will become ibadah and will become rewarding. This is the beauty of it. And this is why we need to learn these instructions about our deen. So number one here, we need to remember sometime when you... Talk about these things and you tell people that our deen is very complete, comprehensive deen that talks about all aspects of the life and everything that you have to go through and you deal with in your life, this religion will talk about. So that thing, that thing, deen is very restrictive. And then I will have restrictions in everything. But this is not a fact. This is not true because deen is giving us instructions But these instructions are not difficult to follow. Very easy instructions. Now, just as an example, as we have the sunnah way of eating, and then starting the meal on the name of Allah, ending it with the name of Allah, if any of us would eat otherwise and in a different way, and then would try to eat according to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is there anyone who would say, because of eating according to the sunnah, I'm going a lot through a lot of difficulties. I cannot digest the food. I cannot eat. I cannot, I'm not able to eat properly. I cannot eat all kind of nice food. No, the, these restrictions are not there. I mean, it's not difficulty. And 
the reward for that is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, a person who starts his meal with the name of Allah, ends it with thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of his sins will be forgiven. All of the sins are forgiven by what? By eating food. He didn't perform salah. He didn't recite Quran. It's not that he woke up in the middle of the night and he's struggling. No. He was eating some food that he liked to eat. But he ate it according to those instructions. The reward is all the sins are being forgiven. So this is the beauty of it. So I was saying is not restrictive. Makes it easy for us. And why does Islam talk about all of these rules and all of these different laws of our life? As I mentioned, because so that each and everything of our life will become ibadah. We won't have to break off from all the other things that we need in our life. We won't have to break off from our family members, from our relatives, and leave the work and neglect responsibilities and run out into the jungle in order to be considered virtuous servants of God. We can do everything at the same time, and the whole life is ibadah. Although we are working for ourselves, we are do, going to work to earn uh, for our own earnings and uh, uh, trying to make our living. Uh, all of this will become ibadah. As Islam gives us instructions, so of course the purpose of these instructions is not just to admire Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He doesn't need our admiration. He's already been admired by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book. So he doesn't need it from us. And he's not going to get any higher by us admiring him. It's really Allah's blessing that he would allow us to even take the name of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with respect. <coughs> so these instructions are very important to understand and to follow. And we will learn these instructions from the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi have compiled this book Riyadh al-Salihin where he brings different chapters and he keeps on uh, and, uh, and he collects different uh, ahadith, few ahadith. He doesn't go into too much detail, some ahadith in each chapter so that we can understand the values of the deen and the sunnahs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This chapter over here that we are about to start today is about dress. And of course dress is something that is an essential part of our life. Something that each and every human being has to deal with. And part of the deen that Islam will give us instructions about our dress. Before I go any further explaining anything about Islamic rules about dress, we have to remember sometimes translations can be very misleading. And when we translate words into other languages, normally we borrow different words of that language to express what we are trying to say. And not necessarily that this word will refer to the same thing as it refers to in the original language. For example, the word salah. If a person who's not familiar with our deen will read the translation of Qur'an and will look at the word salah over there translated as prayer and says believers are those who offer their prayers to God. So he says, I pray to God also. And he considers his prayer as salah because this is how it is translated into his language as prayer. We know the word salah in deen is referred to a special way of offering a prayer that has wudu before it, facing the qibla, proper dress, 
and then starting it with takbir, reciting sana, surah fatiha, and surah, rukur, sujood, all of these are requirements. But that person will never be able to understand this point just by looking at the translation. So translation, as good as it might be, many times it becomes a leading point. And one of the main reasons a lot of people are misled of many nations is really translation. Translation sometimes becomes one of the worst factor in a person getting away from the right track and the right understanding of something. And this is a fact with not only religious books, it's a fact with any kind of science and any kind of books. When you translate a book from one language to another language, and a person who would just read the translation will not know what does it stand for and the terms, what they mean and what they refer to, he will be totally misled in that field. No matter what field that might be. And as I gave the example of Salah, can be very well understood that a person who would read the translation of Quran and he goes through the word Salah, he can be very easily misled that Salah means a prayer and prayer, I'm offering a prayer too. And he can keep on arguing with us that your book says, if you offer the prayer, you are considered a true believer. And I'm offering my prayer, so I'm a true believer according to your book. Now, no matter how much you would try to make him understand that no, this is not what Salah means, if he depends on translations, then he is misled. And similarly, we go through this a lot of time and we find a, a lot of these examples in the collection of Quran and Hadith that words are translated into different languages and because of the translation, people are misunderstanding the concept of the religion about that topic. And one of them as related to our topic is the word dress. Dress, as soon as you talk about a dress, when sisters will talk about, I'm looking for a dress. They have a specific picture of a dress. As soon as they use this word, they have a specific picture that, okay, this is a dress for a woman. Thing that they have been seeing in the stores called dress. This is a complete dress. And it may even be half naked. Still, is a dress. Same thing for men. When we talk about dress, when it's translated, you have a special picture of that dress. When you go and go to the department store and you tell them, I'm looking for a complete dress, he would show you a dress. So when we translate this word as a dress, I don't want anyone to picture these dresses. Although I'm not saying these are haram because we can make one rule. We inshallah will talk in detail about these rules that will give us a good understanding of rule about clothing in Islam. And clothing might be a different word than you, to use than a dress. But of course, for a complete suit, you might have to use the word suit or dress. And both of them have a specific picture in our mind that go with it. But I don't want anyone to think that this is what we are referring to. Another beautiful example in our field that we will be facing with in our these hadith as we go to the hadith will be the word shirt. As soon as we say a shirt, we have a specific meaning and dress or, or a picture behind it with, that goes with that word. But the picture in the hadith of the word shirt, because they, it's used qabis, and qamis will be translated only as shirt because we don't have a better word to translate it. So now right away the picture of our shirt that we call shirt in this language will come in mind. But we should not be attaching these pictures to these translations of the hadith. This is something that we have to keep clear. Because these words can be misleading sometime. We might use Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wore a white shirt and a... Here, right there, we have a picture of ourselves putting this shirt on and thinking this is the type of shirt that was. We will talk, inshallah, what type of shirt and what type of 
dress or clothing that he used to wear. But this was some of, uh, just a point for us to remember about the translation of the wordings. And inshallah, I'll keep on explaining as the words will come, we will explain what, is it, what does it refers to in the language. When it comes to clothing and dresses, a lot of people think Islam has nothing to do with what we wear. You can wear anything. That has nothing to do with religion. That has, I mean, that's part of your culture. And whatever type of dress people of your culture, of your community, of your country wear, that's something that should be acceptable. And Islam has nothing to do with it. But remember, our clothing are something that affect our life. This is something that really have an effect on our deeds also. How we behave, how we do things, it will have an effect on it. When you are wearing shoes, you will have a different way, style of walking comparing to when you are wearing the slippers that you wear normally for the bathroom. With these slippers, a person will not go too far from his home. He has that those slippers on, he will be afraid to go to his neighbor's home with those because they won't like it. And as he's walking, he might even try to hide them and want people not to see them because he doesn't feel, see now this, this is his feeling. He doesn't feel the way he was feeling with his shoes. A person who has some work boots on, some sneakers on, his feeling will be totally different than he has some nice shoes on that he normally wears when he goes to the party. If in a party a person went with his sneakers, although he goes jogging with them and he wears them at workplace, but now because he's in that party, he tries to hide them as much as he can so that people won't see that he came with his stickers over here. His feelings is different now. Why? What's changing his feeling? The thing that's in his feet. That he's wearing in his feet. That is really affecting his feeling. When we put some nice and clean clothes on us, you have a different feeling comparing to when your clothes are dirty. That has a feeling on our heart. It makes you feel. You put some nice cloth on. And as soon as you came to the masjid, you saw some dirt on it, some black marks on it. How upset you would feel that, oh, where did I get this from? I never saw it. I thought I'm putting on some nice dress. This was a new. And if she gave it to you, then she's in trouble as you go back home. Because you didn't see it before giving it to me. I told you to give me some nice dress. And here you have this with all of this dirt on it. And you gave it to me. I was impressed in front of all of those people. Where of this feeling came, came from? From that dress. And the mark on that dress has an effect on our heart. So see how things are affecting us. And normally I like to give the example of. Two examples that will make us really understand the effect of it. One is those who are in the self-defense. If you have seen even your children, someone who's in self-defense, they have a special dress for that. As soon as they put that on, although this was his second day, but he feels now he's so strong, he can do anything, he'll start punching here and there, punch his brothers, sisters, wall, door, he'll start punching everything, because he feels that this is who he is now. Same thing with those who are in one of the, who are entrusted in sports and they dress like one of those players that they have seen. As soon as he would put his dress on that, he, that is for playing, as soon as he will put on, he wants to bounce the ball. He wants to keep on playing with the ball, do something and keep on jumping around. He takes the, that dress off. You put some different cloth on him, give him a different type of dress. He's changed. 
A second example that will make us understand the effect of, of the dress on our soul is, I don't know if how many of us, and I'm sure many of us may have experienced this, sometime you find a mask. And here you think, let me scare someone with it. It was a scary mask. You put it on your face. And as soon as you put the mask on your face, what is it the next thing that you do? You'll go out and hide away behind something, behind a wall, behind a door, and your children around, you go, boo, start making some noise. Why are, is, the, is this person trying to do all of this now? He feels by putting this mask, I became scary. And I can scare children. I can scare people. And that noise that he's making, he would never make that noise otherwise if that mask wasn't there on his face. As soon as the mask came on his face, that the effect of it is that he feels, I look, for example, the mask was like a jinn, like a dog, like something. And he will make, start making the noise of that thing like what he feels that he looks like. What had that effect on him? What made this person sometime will start barking like a dog? Sometimes you hide behind a wall and you start barking. What makes the person do that? He felt now he is resembling the dog. He's sitting like that, he's hiding, and he can be, he's really pretending to be a dog, so he will bark like a dog. This is the effect of the situation he has put himself in. And if it is a mask, then this is the effect of that mask that is on his face. So this is the effect of our dress. This is the effect of what we have on us and how we look like. If it is such a great effect, Islam is not going to just let us go without giving us some proper instructions about it because it will affect us. And these effects are not minor. These are major effects on our life. Therefore, Islam gives us a lot of simple, I have to use this word, a lot of very simple instructions about the type of dress we should have on. Once Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu had some, he got a gift, a very nice pair of uh, clothes. As soon as he put it, put, on, put, put it on, he went to the masjid. After salah, he rushed home and he took it off saying to his family that I was feeling arrogant as I had this on me. I had the feeling of arrogance in my heart and I could feel it in my heart as I had it on me. Therefore, I have to take it off. Where did that feeling come from? Here, Umar radiallahu anhu is saying, from the cloth that he had on. Some people will in return tell us, my heart is clean. What does this cloth have to do with my deen, with my iman? My heart is clean. Remember, if you have a fruit and you see the skin of the fruit has some dots on it, you don't buy the fruit. Why? Do you normally eat the skin? No. Normally we peel it off. But why we won't buy that fruit? Because we know the dose on, this, uh, uh, on the skin is because it's rotten from inside. So the effect of inside is shown on the outside. Now no matter how much that store owner and the salesman over there will tell us that don't worry about it. These dudes are just on the skin. You peel it off and eat it. He'll say, no. I don't like it. Because I know it comes from inside. These dudes on the skin are from inside. So remember, the effect of inside shows on, our, on, on the out, outer body of a human being is not that we can do something on the outer body without, with our different parts of the body. I'm doing something with my hands and hurting people. And I can tell people that my heart is very peaceful and I love people in my heart. No. Whatever I'm doing with my hands, with my feet, with my tongue, it's really the effect of what's in my heart. Whether I agree to it or I don't, this is effect. So, we cannot neglect 
the outer saying that my inner path of iman my, in my heart is clean and is pure, therefore I don't have to worry about how I dress, how I act, how I behave. These, all of these things are only some signs of what is inside. Talking about some rules about dress before we go into the hadith so we can understand these rules. The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the dress is, Ya Bani Adam, O children of Adam, this surah, this is in surah A'raf, ayah number 26, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adam, qad anzalna alaykum libasan yuwari sawatikum. O children of Adam, we have sent a type of clothing on you that will cover your shame, will cover the power, the concealable parts of your body. So this is the first thing we have to know about the code of dress in Islam. This is the first rule, and that is, it has to be a type of clothing that will cover the body, and at least the path that is satr. And what is satr? For a man, from navel to knee is satr. For a woman, for, for the women, the satr is from the whole body, excluding the face and the hands. And according to some narrations, the feet are also excluded. Remember, we are not talking about hijab, we are just talking about satr. So, for a, for, for, for a, for a woman, her satr is the whole body, excluding face, hand, and feet. In other words, when she is dressing, the dress has to be such a way that when she goes in front of other people, in front of other ladies, the other parts of the body should be covered. Dress has to be such that it covers the satr. This is the first rule of the sharia about dress. And the first effect of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From Quran al kareem we learn is as soon as the person starts disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first effect of that on person's life is that this person's dress changes. This person will become shameless. This person will start showing off the parts of the body that are concealable according to the Sharia of Islam. Where do we learn this from? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many ayahs of the Quran al kareem in many places in Quran al kareem talks about the story of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu was salam. And he tells us, Shaitan went to them. وَقَاسَمَهُمَا إِنِّي لَكُمَا لَمِنَ النَّاصِحِينَ He took oath before Adam and Hawa alayhim salam that I'm very faithful and well-wisher for you people. I'm not trying to mislead you. Who is that shaitan taking oath? I'm not trying to mislead you. I'm only trying to tell you something that will benefit you. And he made them eat from the tree. We all read Quran and at least I'm sure we know this story of Sayyidina Adam alayhi salatu was salam. What was the first effect of eating from that tree? What is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in Quran al-Kareem? فَأَكَلَا minha. They ate from the tree. فَبَدَتْ لَهُمَا سَوْآتُهُمَا Right away, that dress of the Jannah was taken off from them. وَطَفِقَا يَخْصِفَانِ عَلَيْهِمَا مِنْ وَرَقِ الْجَنَّةِ And right away, they had to find leaves of the trees to cover up their bodies. That was the effect of the sun. The effect of the sun is that the person becomes shameless. And this satr starts getting opened up in public. They start opening up their satr in public. All of this is, this is not just because the person is not willing to dress properly according to the code of the sharia. It's because that person is committing other sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken that dress, the proper 
runs away from this person and does not want to cover his sutra properly. And therefore, covering up the sutra and keeping it covered so no one will see the sutra, it's one of the fara'id of Islam, just like salah, like zakah, like anything else. This is one of the fara'id Islam of Islam. This is not option. And is as important farida as any other faraid of Islam that we normally try to learn and practice because our other ibadahs, including our salah, will not be accepted if the satr is not covered properly. A woman is performing the salah and her hair are showing. What do we find in the hadith about it? The satr, that it was bad of the satr for her to cover it. Is not covered, is not concealed, it's uh, it's open. The whole salah is not accepted. So that is the effect of this dress of the not covering the satr that even the ibadahs starts getting rejected. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was so careful about this, and he gave a lot of instructions about it. And in one of his ahadiths, he said, before the day of judgment, as sins will be performed openly in this ummah, there will be nisa'un kasiyatun ariyat. There will be women in this ummah who will be dressed, but at the same time, they are naked. They are dressed, but they are naked. These are the wordings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kasiyatun Ariyatun, dressed but naked. Mumilatun ma'ilatun. They will be attractive and they will be getting attracted to others. They will never enter the Jannah. They will never even be able to smell the fragrance of the Jannah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, Wa inna rihaha la yujadu min masirati kada wa kada. The fragrance of the Jannah can be smelled from a distance of 500 years of, from the Jannah. But they won't even be able to get that close to the Jannah. They will be kept far away from it. What is this? This is dress. This is the importance of proper clothing in Sharia. This is what he's talking about. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. One of the most authentic book of hadith. And what does it mean when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us that they will be dressed but they are naked? Either their dress is so short that instead of being a a mean to cover the body and to cover the beauty, it's even becoming more attractive. Or the type of dress that they wear in public they wear it, I mean, they wear it's all covering the body, but it's so attractive that even if a person was not to look at this individual, but because of the dress, everyone is looking at her. And it can also refer to dress being so thin that you can see through, or being so tight that the shape of the body can be seen. So here we learn these rules that satr, covering the satr means not only having a garment on top of it, it has to be a type of garment that will conceal it, that will cover it up properly. At the same time, is not so thin that you can see through it, otherwise it defeats the purpose. At the same time, it shouldn't be so attractive that everyone starts looking at this individual just because of that dress. Yes, nice and decent as inshallah I'll talk about it. Nice and decent dress is required and is good. And the fourth, number four thing is, it shouldn't be so tight on the body that you can see the shape of the body. Because if it is like that, it's not considered a dress that is covering the body and is not considered, this person is not considered as an individual who is covering the satr according to the laws of the Sharia of Islam. So to cover our satr, it has to be loose, it has to be 
uh, covering the full satar and at the same time it has to be in such a way that you cannot see through it and you cannot see the shape of the body. Once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa sallam what is the best thing for a woman? What is the best thing for a woman to do in her life? Sahaba Ridwanullahi alayhi wa remained quiet, didn't know what to answer. Ali radiallahu anhu was in that gathering. He quietly got up, went to his home, and we all know who was his wife. Fatima radiallahu anhu, the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said to himself, if anyone knows the answer to this other than the Prophet of Allah, it would be his daughter. So he went to her and asked her the same question. She gave him the answer. He went back. And still Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had not answered the Sahaba Ridwanullah alayhi He was waiting to get the reply from them. Why? Because as you make people think about something, it gives them the importance and give them the way to uh, open up their mind to think about that topic. Otherwise, normally we may not think about that topic at all. So he went back. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I know the answer. What is the answer? He said, Ya Rasulullah, the best thing for a woman is that she doesn't see no man and no man sees her. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I'm sure this is not your reply. Where did you get it from? Who told you this? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I quietly went home and I asked Fatima quickly and came back. He said, yes. She is the only person who can answer this other than me. Because Fatima tu bud'atum minni. She is part of my blood and flesh. And she is the one who would have that understanding. So, this is Again, we are talking about proper clothing in Sharia and the importance of proper clothing in Sharia. One more thing that we need to remember when our clothing are not proper. And what is clo proper clothing? You may have some guesses in your mind at this time, but I haven't talked about it yet. Except for one rule about it. And that is about covering the satar. And we mentioned three things about how it should cover the satar. But we talked about only one rule right now. We didn't talk about we didn't talk about all the rules. But one thing that we need to remember as an importance of proper clothing in Sharia, and that is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said there are two types of sins. One are those that a person commits it, but he commits those sins secretly, tries to hide them from people. He doesn't want people to know about them. And there are other type of sin that a person performs them openly, publicly. There is hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu ummati mu'afan illa al-mujahirun. My whole ummah has the chance of getting Allah's forgiveness on the day of judgment except for those who commit the sins openly. And they go in public committing these sins. Proudly they commit these sins. They feel good, up, they feel good about themselves at the time of committing the sin. The sin that is affiliated with the dress is something that normally committed publicly and openly and proudly. When a person is having that type of clothing and that type of dress that is against the Sharia, that person is not having that dress to stay at home. Otherwise, it won't be haram just in front of your own husband and wife. But the person has it on to go out in public with it. And so that people will see it, people will admire it. And this person will be proud of his dress or her dress. This is what Al-Mujahirun means in this hadith. That a person who's doing it openly and proud of his sin. Committing a sin and being, pr being proud of disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, I cannot, I 
there is, I cannot guarantee that person will ever get a forgiveness. Every other person has a chance of getting the forgiveness except for those who commit the sins openly. And with openly, this is also, this is proudly also that look at my dress, trying to attract people, trying to show it to people. So this is something very dangerous and something that God forbid, God forbid, can be a cause of being too far away from the Jannah and from the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the worst things that brings the la'na and the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when a person starts committing sins openly and is proud of his or her sins. That really totally destroys the person, brings total destruction. And always la'na is descending on that person. Imagine a house where the la'na of Allah is coming all the time. What do we expect from our children to get? If this is what parents are bringing home, what children are going to get? And if children are bringing that thing, of course, everyone is being affected. So it's something here we can understand how important this code of life is in our life. And how important it is to pro follow the proper rules of Sharia about our clothing and about the proper dress in Sharia. As we talked about a dress that will be, that should be covering the body and at the same time is not very tight to show the uh, shape of the body. So we, as we are talking about it, we have to be considerate of the type of clothing that we wear, especially I'm talking about men, because many times we end up wearing a type of pants that are very tight. And as soon as the person goes into the sujood, you can see the full shape of the body. Of course, it falls under the same rules and under the same instructions. Wearing the pen itself is not haram. But it has to be something that goes with according to the, in accordance with the laws of the sharia that it doesn't get so tight. And in no position of salah, in no position of the person's day-to-day -day life, that it will be so tight on the body that will show the full shape of the body. Because that's the pad of the satr, from navel to knee for men. And if that shape, if the, that pad of the body, the shape of it is shown and it can be seen, number one, the salah is not done. Number two, that dress is not in accordance with, in, in accordance with the sharia of Islam. So this is something that we have to really keep in mind at the time of putting our pins and our dresses on. The second thing that we need to know about this dress, the second rule, and this is the beauty of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not make just one type of dress compulsory. That all of you wear this long thaw, and whatever we may call it. And every Muslim has to wear this. This is the rahmah of Allah, as I said. The codes of this life, the code of the life given by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa are to be practiced till the day of judgment. And people in different parts of the world will be having, and there will be need to have different type of dress on, different type of clothing. We'll have to put sweaters on, uh, we have to put jack jackets on, we have to wear our coats, we have to wear different type of uh, clothes for working, for doing, for jogging, for playing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not restrict us with one type or few types of dresses that these are the only types that are allowed. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after telling us that it should be something that covers the satr properly, he tells us, Warisha, your dress can be a mean of, of beauty for you. Risha means two things, and this is from the eye of the end. It means beauty and it means comfort. So you can wear, as long as the dress is proper, satr is covering the satr properly, it can be anything and with any value, as expensive as you want, if you feel that this is comfortable for you, and you feel that it looks good on you. So that feeling that this dress looks good on me is not a sign of arrogance. A sahabi asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, sometime a person likes to look good and likes to have some nice clothes on, nice dress on, we all like it. You feel good about yourself. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, this is not arrogance. He was afraid this might be arrogance. He said, no, this is not arrogance. So, feeling good about having nice dress, that alhamdulillah, I feel good, alhamdulillah, I have nice dress on me. There is nothing wrong with it. So, but the rule is that as long as the dress is being put on for this purpose, either it's comfortable or you like it. There is nothing wrong in dressing that as long as it goes with those first instructions of the Sharia. And this is to remind ourselves that Islam doesn't say you have to wear a dress that worth only hundred dollars. You can't go beyond that limit. Or it has to be, don't wear something that worth thousand dollars because it's too expensive. Comfort and good luck. As long as it's for these, one of these two purposes, Sharia says, go ahead and do it. But that condition is still there. And that is, make sure is not to show off. It's not so that people will see me and will say, oh, you have some good expensive dress on you. So it's not for showing off, it's not for showing people. And at the same time, it's not just wastage of money. Wastage of money simply means, I have three jackets. And here I see a fourth one in the store. I don't even know what to do with those three because in every winter I just end up using one or two maximum. The third one is extra also. And here just because I like it, I'll buy it. This is wastage of money. What are you going to do with the other three? Throw them in the garbage? Yes, if we have a proper use for those, unfortunately most of the time in this part of the world especially, we don't have the proper use. And that is giving it to a needy person. Here even the needy people will ask you for a new one. They don't even want to put an old one, used one on. So what are we going to do with those used ones? They normally go into the garbage. Or you just try to find some, some way to put them. Give them here or there, different places. But this is wastage of money. And therefore, it falls under the category of Israf. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, which is in Sahih al-Bukhari again, Kul ma shi'at. Eat whatever you like. No restrictions in the Sharia. As long as halal, no matter how expensive it is. You go to the most expensive restaurant. You like the food over there, eat. And wear, put any type of clothing that you like, no matter how expensive they are, you can use them. As long as you save yourself from two things. Number one, Saraf, which means wasting money. That is not just, you're not buying it just because, oh, I have money. And here I like it. There is no need for it. You have something similar to it. And you're going to throw the other ones in the garbage. So this is Israf. So as long as it's not wastage of money. And number two, Wamakhyala is not for the purpose of showing off and being arrogant. So the purpose of Putting it on is not for other people, it's for my own good. I like it. A person goes and buys some type of shoes or sneakers that are two, three hundred dollars. Whereas he can find another sneakers for twenty, thirty dollars. But he feels very comfortable wearing those, walking with those. Alhamdulillah, it's his for his own comfort. Not, nothing wrong with that. As long as it's not for the purpose, oh, because of the name of the company, people will see me wearing this with this name, so everyone will like it. So it's for showing the people. Otherwise, people will say, no matter how expensive it is, people will not like it. It's a, one of those brand names and people won't like it and uh, everyone will look down at me because of my shoes. That shouldn't be the purpose. So this is the second thing. Once a sahabi came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah. Uh, and he started talking to him. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw that the sahabi has some old dress on him. He asked him, are you in need of some money? He said, no, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has given me a lot. He said, Min ayyil mali Allah. What type of wealth do you have? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a lot of camels, I have horses, I have cattle, I have a lot. Allah blessed me with all kind of wealth. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِذَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ مَالًا فَلْيُرَ أَثَرَ نِعْمَتِهِ عَلَيْهِ Once Allah has blessed you with wealth, then it should be seen on you. Don't then wear something like this because you don't, I mean, it doesn't look good. So wear something that is decent, that is good. He's not asking him 
to buy something expensive. But at the same time, Allah has blessed you, so use it. Put it on. So look how he's balancing the two things. He didn't say to the Sahabi, oh, you're doing great. Otherwise, all of us will be just looking for all dresses. On the other hand, he doesn't want us to just keep on wasting money either. As far as his instruction for his wife was, he said to Aisha radiallahu anha, Ya Aisha, la tastajiddi thawban hatta tarqi'ihi. Aisha, don't buy a new dress until you have patches on the old one. Instruction to his family. That as far as being my, in my home, Aisha, use it till the last minute that it can be used. And then, once you see that it no more room for patching it, and now, now you can do something else with it and buy another one. But this Sahabi is having some old dress. He says to him, go ahead and buy another one because if Allah bless you, it should be seen. Don't show yourself being very poor in spite of having all of that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings on you. So we have to keep that balance. Number three, and I will just mention it, and inshallah we will end. We will talk in more detail about it in our next sessions. And that is, it shouldn't be the type of dress that we are using it only to show ourselves belong to some other nations. We borrowed it from other nations and we are wearing it not because it's a good dress. We wear it because so that we hide ourselves between that nation. We try to show that I'm one of you people by putting that type of dress on. I'll talk in more detail, inshallah, about this. And one more rule that is coming, inshallah, we'll talk about it in our next sessions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give all of us the right understanding of deen. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to surat al-mustaqeem. Aqul qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Wa li sa'ir al-muslimina wal-muslimat. Wa akhir da'wana. Anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.